one of the reasons to make work a happy, tolerable experience for people that they can maintain for a long time is because you want the average tenure across your whole population of employees to be four years, not two years. It's worth a humongous amount of money to the company. Something that we talk about in the early days, some, I actually think should be discussed more, is like founder company fit. Jack, it's great to have you on the other side of the of the table today in terms of me interviewing you. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining. My pleasure. What's going on? It's nice to be on this side. It's much easier over here. Yeah, excited to jam and uh, share some of the the lessons that you've picked up uh, a, along the way. The, the the first I want to start with is you have this idea that one of the startup superpowers um, that that early founders should should develop is how to discover undiscovered talent how to discover and recruit and convince to join undiscovered talent. Of course, the, the old Keith Ravoy, Peter Thielism, uh, you can't you know, compete with Google and Facebook, et cetera, open AI for, for, for talent. Um, you, and so you need to do something different. How do you go about doing that practically? What, 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 what does that mean? How do you find these people? Why don't you sh uh, unpack that a bit more? Yeah, so I, I think I first heard, I'm sure many people have said this, I first heard it from, from Keith, I think, and it was, uh, you know, when Lattice was like very early in its journey. And one of the things that happens when you start a company, I mean, honestly, this happens not just right when you start a company, unless you like become Stripe, it kind of happens forever, is you realize that there's always a bigger fish and somebody else can always pay more. They can offer better benefits. There's just like so many surface things that a candidate's going to like. And when you're just getting started, every fish is a bigger fish. And so then you're asking yourself questions like, well, why, why is this person who's so qualified and they've got all this experience and they're super smart and they're really talented, like, why are they working here? And it's like, well, maybe like, maybe they're, they, maybe they're not going to. Um, and so, you know, you take that idyllic profile and you think about getting them to join at not founder comp, but at, you know, the ninth employee who's getting 0.6% of a tiny company or whatever the case is going to be, you need a real argument for that person to join. And the people who are already these known quantities, they're just not going to, why would they go take that risk? It doesn't make sense. And so I think the, the first most important thing is really facing that reality head on and saying that it doesn't make any sense that the person who is an A plus on all those dimensions, on experience, talent, proven track record, it's like done the next stage. It doesn't make any sense that they're going to join you. And so you look that reality in the face. You say, okay, well, how are we going to compete? And the answer, the, the best answer turns out to be finding the people who are in fact great, but the world just doesn't realize it yet. And uh, that's the mindset I think that all early stage founders, you know, sort of need to adopt if they want to, if they want to build great teams. Um, and so then, you know, tactically, how do you do it? Um, one is you got to turn over every stone. You have to be willing to spend a lot more time. You got to be willing to not just like rely on the LinkedIn and the resume. You have to be willing to really dig deeper with people and see who's got, you know, this potential that hasn't been realized yet. Who's so young and early in, early in their career that they haven't had time to be proven yet or who actually was in a role before where they just like weren't set up for success for X, Y, Z reason, or who's just been so outside the ecosystem that no one's like looked to bet on them at all. And so like there's these dimensions, but it's, it's, it's something like that. Yeah. And I, I think one thing that makes Keith so good at it is I think he just identifies really talented young people who haven't been discovered yet. And then just gets introduced to their friends and just kind of like, sort of is able to sort of, uh, you know, be around that circle and just have it grow over time. Referrals are the referrals are like one of the best sources for figuring out like what stones are likely good ones to like start turning over. Like the people who, if you just go around and this, we did this a ton. I mean, I think out of our first 10 employees, like the majority were referrals. Um, and it's not like the world just comes and refers. You got to be a little shameless. Like you got to go ask everybody, you know, who are the three best people you've ever worked with? You don't even need to intro me. Just tell me their names and I'll go do the work. And then you got to go do the work. But like getting that list uh, is like, you know, is huge.
And are you trying to recruit er, er, uh, future founders as part of your early employee set? Are you sort of general athletes? How how do you think about the first 10 to 15 hires? Because it's interesting. You know, sometimes the advice is, hey, go join a company that's clearly working and, um, you know, you'll get experience and then start a company. But the first 10 employees, you usually don't have product market fit yet. So you're asking people to take almost founder level risk. Of, of the company not maybe not working of course it's not founder level you know intensity but but you know it's for like 50 lex, x less upside or 20 x less upside so it's a really tough pitch for the future founder uh, or someone who thinks they could be a founder currently that's true but you do have a good pitch in the first 10 which is unlike unlike the 70th ploy, employee the seventh employee knows everything that's happening at the company and works directly with the founders and is seeing the build from day zero And so at least you have a sale there. At least you've got an argument that you can make to a candidate. Hey, I know you're also looking at the series A or B company, but your role is going to naturally be more specialized. You're not going to be really in the room with the founders. You're not going to see every decision be made and product market fit's going to have already been found versus you come here, you're going to see us find product market fit. You're going to be in the room with everybody. You're going to know everything that's going on. And when I look back at Lattice, our first 10 employees or 15 or 20, you know, the, the, the earliest set, so many of them turned into founders. And that was not true at nearly the same rate, you know, 50 to 100. You know, there's a correlation causation thing in there. But like, I do think that there's a lot of learning that happens from the very jump. So I think there's an argument you can make to employees there. Yeah. And, and you even have this program I thought was fascinating, which is if they stay for a few years, you'll, you'll fund their startup, um, which, which I thought was so clever. And, and you, you've also talked about the importance of, you know, um, people staying longer at, at, a, at a company. And so, um, you know, not just two years, but you, you get most of the gains perhaps at three or four years. And it's interesting because there's somewhat of a tension where if you hire founder types, they'll typically get antsy soon enough, right? And so there's probably some people you consider, they're like, hey, this person's only going to stay a year. And so I'm not sure how much I'll get out of them. And so you're trying to thread the speed spot, whereas they're entrepreneurial enough to make a big impact, but sort of like committed or loyal enough or patient enough to want to stay three, three, three or four years. How do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a couple of concepts in there. First on the sort of like uh, the employee, like sort of just like longevity piece. Um, there's a really good piece. I think um, Maya, who uh, used to be at uh, the, the greenhouse head of people, um, she's at Stripe now, um, wrote a piece about employee lifetime value. And the concept was basically just like we think about a customer lifetime value, Companies should be thinking about an employee lifetime value. And the employee lifetime value curve is shaped with a lot of expenses up front and a lot of months in the early days where the employee is a net drag on the company. Then they're neutral, where the cost on the people around them equals their productivity. And then the, you know, the curve goes up and up and up. And in, you know, over time, you've got, you know, really productive and really low drag. And if you cut off the lifespan of an employee and they only stayed for one year. They might have dragged more than they added and you paid them a lot of money to be a net drag. But employees in years three, four, sometimes five, although, you know, it depends. Like in in some cases, people get tired and burn out. But like, you know, certainly once you get past a couple years, people are so impactful. And you can see this in like, you know, the easiest mathematical place to see this is in like sales reps. They just get used to selling the thing. They know how to communicate with people around them. They build up like, you know, some, you know, list of prospects over time. Um, They just get familiar with like the sales process and they become so productive. And I think it's easy to see the math in sales, but this is true for engineers. It's true for people in finance. It's true everywhere. And so um, this is one of the, this is one of the like less understood things about productivity, I think, where um, it's one of the arguments to, you know, besides the, I suppose, moral argument of if you're going to make one about like burnout, but like one of the reasons to make work a happy, tolerable experience for people that they can maintain for a long time is because you want the average tenure across your whole population of employees to be four years, not two years. It's worth a humongous amount of money to the company. The idea behind the, uh, the invest in your people fund, which you mentioned, which is basically like Lattice's way to sort of support employees, no matter what they want to do next, is basically acknowledging the reality that like, la- like no company is going to be the right thing for everyone forever. And it shouldn't be. And that's fine. And so on the other side of this, 
you know, like we want people to hang for as long as we possibly can in happy, impactful, well-fitting roles. But we also know that that's not a forever thing. And people give a lot of their life and energy and effort to Lattice. And I think it's a really cool thing to support back and to say, hey, when you go, we want to help you go in style. And whether that means you're starting your own company, whether we can help introduce you to amazing other companies, like we want Lattice to be like an amazing place to be from. And I think that's like a holistic mindset. And so in, in many ways, this program just embodies that holistic mindset for me. Yeah. No, it's um, it's fascinating. W one thing I picked up from your sort of management style is that you want to leave with people on good terms. And the you know, companies are so messy, right? There, there are people where, you know, just have been a founder and CEO where I made a mistake with an employee or an employee made a mistake with me or part, partings are difficult sometimes. And your ability to sort of like, I don't know, take it on the chin is the right word or just sort of suck it up. I, I think what I interpret from you or understand from your perspective is this idea of like, it always just makes sense to be on good terms. Even, even if things didn't go super well, let's just have a great story about it. And because, you know, careers are long, you know, reputation is, is, is a long game. And so it's, it's amazing that you're That's able to do I that because a lot of people aren't able to do that. I think of it that way. And, and this is true both ways, you know, like I both aspire to have somebody quit who I don't want to quit and still maintain a great relationship with them. And I aspire to be able to let somebody go who really wanted to stay and be able to maintain a great relationship with them. And so if you frame it in those extremes, and it was, you know, usually departures are, or they're often in the middle, right? Like they're often both sides kind of saw it and it's just kind of who broke the ice. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of gray in this, but you just take the extreme cases of it was all the employee's choice and it was all the company's choice. And then you ask yourself, what would it look like for in either of those extremes for there to still be a friendship afterwards? What would that require? And is that worth pursuing? And to me, I think it's definitely worth pursuing. I think it just like requires acting like a regular human who cares about other people. You know, like people get so weird about this stuff and it's for understandable reasons. But I, this is like an area where like, just like my, my conception of what it means for there to be a departure, whether it was voluntary or involuntary has really changed over time in a way where I don't see it as this it's not this huge negative thing in the long term. It hurts in the short term. And in many cases, it's like the best thing that ever happened to everybody. Yeah, totally. No, it's a great way of, of looking at it. You, you, you've mentioned that one analogy for hiring is, is maybe like startup investing, where it, it doesn't always work out. When it works out, it, it works big. And that we should expect some level of slack or, or failure built into it. Otherwise, we're maybe not taking enough bets or not taking enough risks. Um, is that how you see it? Or un unpack that a little bit. Yeah. So it goes back to like the, the opening uh, discussion here, which was like, for a startup, you're not taking bets on sure things. Not that there's ever such thing as a sure thing, because every company is different. But like, you know, a company like Google, who is, you know, a very mature company who has hired, you know, gajillions of people, they are going to be pretty confident by the time they make a hire, they're going to have a very high confidence interval that it's going to be a good fit a seed or series A or B company, there's no way that they're going to get to that confidence interval. And in fact, to, your, to this question, I argue that they shouldn't because a lot of the best people are not these obvious, like, you know, you look around the hiring panels of a lot of the greatest hires that a lot of companies have ever made. They were not all a room full of two thumbs ups. A lot of them had, eh, this person really hasn't had the experience or this person had like, you know, they were a little cocky in the interview or, hey, I did a reference and the last, you know, manager they had said they were impossible or whatever. There's a lot of reasons why. And, you know, going back to the diamonds in the rough analogy, there's a rough. They're not, they're not shiny diamonds yet. So to me, I think that goes with the territory is that you need to be expecting a distribution of outcomes on your employees that you hire. You know, you want every single one to be, you know, amazing, but like, you also just know that out of a hundred, you're not going to get a hundred, right. You're not going to get 90, right. You're going to get like 70, right. If you're amazing and that's okay. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Are you building a business? 
Well, if you haven't already been asked by potential customers or investors about SOC 2, ISO 2701, GDPR, or HIPAA compliance, you will be. Achieving compliance can unlock major growth for your company and build a foundation of trust, and Vanta can help. Vanta automates up to 90% of compliance work, getting you audit ready in weeks instead of months and saving you up to 85% of associated costs. Vanta scales with your business, helping you successfully enter new markets, land bigger deals, and earn customer loyalty. Bonus, for our one to 1,000 listeners, you get $1,000 off Vanta. Just go to vanta.com slash 1,000. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash one zero zero zero. One thing I've been impressed with, I remember you telling me that you you had a couple YC founders or just former founders uh, become executives at Lattice. And so it's interesting because you're able to sort of sell former founders, story, not just future founders, but former founders a story of, hey, you, 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 tried, you, know, you tried building something, but hey, Lattice is going to be so big and you'll learn. Like, talk through that story of, of how you're able to, to recruit the, these former founder types. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a superpower when you can make it work. And, um, it is, uh, I think something that not enough companies do because the experience of being a founder just creates this ownership mentality that in my experience of working with people kind of seems to like never go away. Like, I think there is this like once a founder, always a founder thing, which is that once somebody has felt complete ownership at the company level, they kind of never shake that. And that can actually be really aggravating sometimes once somebody's in a position role and they're still, they just can't help but care. And I think like that is like a thing that happens, but like, it's a good thing. And um, the area where I've seen it be particularly uh, valuable is when you've got a role, usually like a product leadership role, um, where somebody needs to like really break new ground on something and it's going to require you know, some real zero to one thinking and operations and taking on of debt of multiple flavors of, you know, you know, just like on un, un, un sort of uncomfortable work that we all do in the early phases that a lot of people who've only worked in the later phases, maybe they've read a blog about, but when they see it up close, that's just like too unseemly to deal with. Um, and so, you know, so I, I think it's a huge advantage when you can when you can make it work. I think there's a lot of reasons that former founders want to join another company. It doesn't mean that they want to work at a, at a company that they didn't found forever. But, you know, starting a company is hard. It's taxing. Sometimes people want, you know, they want an interlude in their life. They want a period where they're only going to work 40 hours a week instead of 80 hours a week. And they want to focus on their family or their health a little bit more than being a founder allows them to. So I think there's things like that. Um I think sometimes people just want to learn what, you know, an organization that operates differently that they perceive as operating well works like so that they can take that to their next venture. Um, so I think there's a lot of things. And, and, you know, I think to make it successful, I do think that the founder who has hired other former founders does have to, to make it successful, has to hold a certain respect for the fact that this is a founder who is helping you know, you work on your company, but is a founder. And I do think that just reminding yourself of that in your interactions, and it doesn't mean that you give them special treatment or the rules don't apply to them and whatever else, but I think just being cognizant of that fact and having a certain like, you know, I think you should be grateful to all employees. I always believe that, but having a gratitude to the fact that this is somebody who can and has started their own companies and is coming and working on yours. I think that just keeps you in the right mindset to be the right kind of manager to them. Same way a bit to sort of uh, founder awareness. It's interesting. You, you had this podcast with, with um, uh, your investor, Miles from Benchmark on Invest Like the Best. And you talked about the story of, of, of Lattice and how you had this uh, tension or fork in the road where you could have had the, you know built the same product but gone uh, across you know across customer set and sold to much bigger and bigger companies or sold to the same customer and built more products for them and and Miles has a quote where he's like I, I didn't see Jack sort of getting excited about selling to Workday or or, or something like that um, and I, I saw Jack really excited about this customer set and building more products for that talk more do you think that's a thing that founders should be more aware 
of sort of where they have superpower or super interest on on a customer set or or and, and why couldn't you have sold to to workday you you seem uh you know like like you could do it um t- talk a little bit more, more about that sold to workday size customers you mean or whatever yeah yes 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 or like just gone way bigger yeah yeah we could we could sell to enterprise um i i think the um i think what this what this whole that whole topic kind of gets at to me is something that we talk about in the early days, some, I actually think should be discussed more, is like founder company fit. Just like, you know, the way that an enterprise company shouldn't try to play down market, you know, it's vice versa. And and there's a lot of dimensions like this for companies. So I do think it's not necessarily the only dominating factor in strategic decisions because people can change and you can, you can adjust, you know, the company and the individual's DNA a little bit. But I think it is it is a helpful component of decision making totally and and speaking of the founder market insight go back to even the the idea maze a little bit for 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 lattice was it more was it hey this idea of performance um you know sort of views or performance coaching is 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 broken and and you know we can build something better or was it hey i have this uh you know a, a, a amazing network of of startups that i could sell to and i you know hr space is, is underexplored or kind of where and how did you get conviction on, on this space and then the product? It came because we had already been in touch with a lot of customers on a unsuccessful first product. So we built OKRs because we thought my co-founder and I left a company where that was a struggle and we thought that was going to be the market opportunity. We built that. It didn't really work. But in the process of getting to know those customers and trying to sell them and then retain them and learn from them, at some point when we realized it wasn't working, we already had these relationships and we already had these ins at these organizations where we were able to say like, what else is there? And the depth of those relationships that we had built from that first go opened up the clarity for us. So the the maze happened because a first failed product got us close enough to enough customers is what I was saying. Yeah. And it relates to a tweet you had, I just want to read, which is a formula for ramping up a new SaaS company or product. Interview 50 users until you fully understand the problem. Work with five beta pilot customers to get the product right. Stay until they're happy. Get case studies and launch a new product marketing like crazy. So that's what you guys did for, for, uh, you know, figuring out first that you didn't have the right product. That was the best slice of what we did. We did a lot of other (laughs) nonsense that was not that, that was not particularly helpful, but Totally. That was the good stuff. One of your beliefs is that startups underinvest in brand marketing. Why should startups invest more in brand marketing and how should they think about doing that successfully? Yeah. So the first thing is to understand why companies underinvest in brand marketing. Like, like if it's this obvious thing, like why would people not do it? And there's actually a really good reason why it's underinvested in. It doesn't pay off quickly. It is completely unmeasurable it feels ridiculous to do it. Like that's like one of the like under discussed things is like, you feel like such a phony at first when you're doing it, when you're like out there, like writing, you know, blog posts and doing interviews and whatever about this topic where you're like, I'm not, an, I'm, I'd like to be an expert. I'm not an expert yet. Maybe if this thing works, I'll become one. So, you know, there's that. And, and then there's just like lack of resources. And so you're like, if I've got, $200,000 to spend on marketing this year. And I got, you know, a lot of people around me who are asking me to grow my revenue by whatever percent. Am I really not going to spend it on like, m- m- like paid ads or otherwise highly measurable things? Am I really going to just like torch that money into the wind on making a sleeker website and making like, you know, a really great dinner experience for prospective customers. Like I'm not going to do that. Um, and so that helps you see why so many startups or even like early stage or mid stage companies just like don't invest in these things. Like they don't try to foster a community. They don't try to like have like a real voice in the conversation. They don't try to do PR in any kind of meaningful way. Because it's slow paybacks and it's like hard to cut through the noise. And so the result of that, though, is that instead you have all these people doing, you know, the same kind of lower in the funnel tactics and they're spending their money on that. And it's a noisy market and there's more software out there than ever. 
And so it's really, really hard to cut through. And it's my view that like storytelling and narrative is the most powerful and ultimately cheapest way to cut through. Um, it just, it takes a little bit of leap of faith and a little bit of torching of money. <laughs> and, and what were the first things that worked for you? Was it, was it the community? Was it the, the, the sort of the blog or the, the podcast or what was sort of the, when did you identify the bang for your buck that you were getting? There were a couple early blog posts that were really good. I remember one we did that was like um, the cost of employee turnover. And it was basically a blog post that was articulating like how expensive it is to lose employees. And I think the reason that that one was so resonant was because there were a lot of HR people, but also managers and just ICs at companies who were sharing that internally being like, CC, it's really, you don't want to lose me. It's really expensive if you lose me. And we were kind of giving a voice to the people. And uh, that was like, that one got like widely shared and picked up. Um, we also did this thing early where we would do like video interviews with like HR or otherwise business leaders. And, you know, I would sit down with them in person in a relatively well-produced way. And we would like do these really good, you know, good interviews with like well-known people who had like good things and I got to build a relationship with them. We got to learn. And then we got to like create this content that a lot of people wanted to see on lattice.com slash whatever, because it had, you know, Claire Hughes Johnson from Stripe was on it, you know? And so like, that was just like an impactful thing to get going. And then that Slack community that the community mentioned, we, we built like a, we sort of like hosted under our umbrella, but we like didn't, we weren't like advertising lattice in it, but we just like made this thing called resources for humans early on. And it was just this like pretty, you know, organically growing and like vibrant HR community and all that kind of, and, and we were all kind of other stuff too. We did tons of dinners and we would go to lots of conferences and uh, we invested heavily in our materials and our website. And we just like always tried to like look bigger than we were. Hey, We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. MetaView is the AI assistant for interviewing. MetaView completely removes the need for recruiters and hiring managers to take notes during interviews because their AI is designed to take world-class interview notes for you. The result, no more boring note taking. So you could spend more time on what actually matters, being present with candidates and making high quality decisions based on insights, not just memory. MetaView remembers everything about every interview, so you and your team don't have to. And unlike humans, MetaView never gets tired and structures its notes perfectly. Because MetaView gives your team perfect notes from every interview, you'll have 10x better hiring data about every candidate you speak with. Team builders at companies like Brex, Robinhood, Quora, and Replit say MetaView has changed the game because it lets them spend more time having high quality conversations with candidates and less time writing up interview notes. See the magic for yourself for free in your first five interviews. Head over to metaview.ai slash 1000 to get started. That's metaview.ai slash 1000. I'm a proud investor. Are you finding it time consuming to hire high quality remote developers? Pesto Tech is a hiring marketplace that makes finding great remote developers fast and easy. They use large language models to evaluate developers along dozens of parameters, including code quality, performance, and security. All you have to do is answer five simple questions on their website, and Pesto Tech will find you world-class remote developers that fit your company's needs. I've heard great things about Pesto Tech from friends like Ryan Hoover, who are investors. So if you need to start hiring developers fast, go to pesto.tech today. That's pesto.tech. I, I want to segue a bit to, or go back to the founder market fit idea, because one thing we've talked about offline is you're more of an agreeable uh, founder, and, and there's a lot of in the zeitgeist around, hey, be disagreeable. Sort of not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's yeah, so convincing. Right. Um, but not everyone is Keith or Boy. Not everyone is Palmer Lucky uh, or Mike Solana, right? These are, these are amazing people, but not every founder has that archetype. Should they, you know, norm themselves to be like that? Or actually, you know, what are the pros of being agreeable? Talk a little bit about that. So I think that being an agreeable founder is like the minority. Like, I think that like the the consensus view is that to be a great founder, you ought to be disagreeable. And uh, that that's like the prized thing. And there's a certain like honor to that. It seems like in, you know, the startup community of like, I'm disagreeable. That's a trait of great founders. And it is a trait of a lot of great founders. I'm totally not denying that. And it's not even just, I'm not even just like saying it empirically. 
There's a lot of mechanisms through which I understand that being disagreeable is valuable. It means that when people tell you no, you're going to be like less affected by it. It means that you're going to be able to deal with confrontations a lot more easily inside the company. It'll make you hold on to your convictions more tightly because not that you necessarily want to be in disagreements, but you have no aversion to them or whatever. So I think there are a lot of reasons why it's good, but I also think, and it's, I think it's a less told and a less understood thing, how being agreeable as a founder has a lot of value. I think like, you know, the, the meme is that like only super late stage execs who are like, you know, Dilbert's are going to be the agreeable ones. And those are the people who like climb the corporate ladder because they just kind of like are politicians inside companies. I think that there's a way for agreeableness as a founder to be a real superpower. A, it's different. There's a lot of people who want to work for a company and a founder who is more like that. You know, and you look around at the world of great companies and a lot of the founders are disagreeable. And a lot of people are totally happy to live in that context, but there are fewer options for people who are more drawn to an agreeable leader. So I think that's one. I think another is it does help you being agreeable, being a peacemaker, being a consensus builder. It does mean that you are able to build teams and companies that find happy ground and spend less time in fighting because you by your nature are good at getting to those kinds of resolutions because you spent your whole life doing it and it's just how you navigate the world so i think there are, there's value to that and then the last is i do think you know back to the employee thing i think it not that dis disagreeable people are it has nothing to do with being a good or a bad person or anything else like that i don't think it's like agreeable people are good and disagreeable people are bad but I do think as an agreeable person, you know, one of the things that you talked about is I try to leave on good terms with everybody. I try to be friends with everybody who's left Lattice, whether I let them go or they chose to leave. And I, you know, I think that pays off. I think there is value to having good relationships with people, even in the face of conflict. Um, I think it can go too far. And I think the trap for agreeable founders, which I've definitely fallen into at a bunch of moments in time, is not holding your ground in the moments that really matter when you really believe something strongly. And I think that is like the hill to climb for agreeable founders is not letting that be your sort of, you know, your fate. And so I do think you need to balance your agreeableness with extreme stubbornness in the moments that matter to you. And that takes experience, but yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for it. How do you think, just an interesting contrast, your entrepreneurial style, obviously you've both been you know, massively successful, um, you and your brother, Sam, how do you think your entrepreneurial style or skill set uh, sort of o overlaps or differs in the sense of, could he run Lattice or could you run OpenAI or, you know, or how do you think about where is, uh, where, where you guys learn from each other? Well, I don't think I could run OpenAI. <laughs> uh, he could maybe run Lattice. I don't think he would like to. I don't think it would be like the best fit for him. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. Um, yeah. You know, I really do enjoy management. Um, like that, like managing people, I think is something that is one of the reasons I started Lattice in the first place. I think that's like less common actually among founders. I think a lot of founders like actually don't like management particularly. I think they love people. They like work, you know, they like building with people who inspire them. And I think Sam, you know, obviously feels that way. Um, but like, you know, for a company that sells management software, you kind of got to love you kind of got to love management. One of the things that I think is really cool about what Sam has done, not just at OpenAI, but also like, you know, we did this at YC, is he was really willing to bet it all, even when things were already going well. And I think that's something that we all, that's something I've tried to learn from, you know, like with our HRIS investment recently, even though we already had like a company at real scale to like continue making big bets when you've got something to lose. I think that's what's, it's easy to make big bets when you have nothing to lose, but I think continuing to make big bets when you have a lot to lose, I think that is where really special things can happen. So I think that is like a, that that's like a very cool thing about the style there. So yeah, I don't know. We definitely have, we definitely have different styles. Um, yeah. Also, I just want to ask one last question because we haven't yet gotten into it in this series. And I think it's an interesting one, you know, on, on the path to getting to one to a thousand, 
there's a lot of exciting moments, you know, biggest, you know, big fundraise, customer closings, you know, milestones, and, and you a lot of us have, have done it all. But every CEO goes through this stint of, hey, we're in a tough moment right now. And it's not just like right now, but it might even be like the next three months or something. Like, like there's just a period yeah. of time that you know sucks and you know oh, is yeah. going to continue to suck. And you just have to like yeah. push through it. And every founder yeah. goes through it, right? Every, 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 any scale. Every founder goes through multiple. Exactly. Exactly. Every founder and, goes through multiple. Absolutely. And so we both do a lot of coaching of founders, investing in founders. And when people come to you and you're like, hey, I'm, I'm going through this, this moment. How have you been able to handle those moments yourself or, or give something that's sort of like what you've learned about navigating sort of the founder psychology or, or what advice you, you give to, to others out there on the, on the, you know, sort of roadblocks to, to one to a thousand sort of these mental ones. Two thoughts. One is try to, where you can reframe negatives into positives and choose a different mindset whenever you can. And so like an easy example that I, you know, we'll share with founders is, you know, we had a, like a failed fundraise at our series B and we just like, couldn't get the capital. And what that led to, although I didn't see it in the first bit of time, but I very much saw it once we got into it, was it led to a period of incredible intensity from the whole company of real creativity as a result of the constraints and much stronger operations. And so by the time we got the capital, we had like, you know, it was like we had been training for a marathon up in the mountains and then we like got to come down from the mountains and it was like amazing and it didn't feel good at the time. But by the end, I was able to flip my perspective of, oh, wait a second. We're like training for a marathon in the mountains. Like this is good. Like, I don't know how it works. Is it something about hemoglobin? But it just like got, it just got us to be so strong. So I think that's one is like, see if you can flip your perspective on whatever the hard thing is. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, and then the other is like, to the extent possible, zoom out and just recognize that, you know, we all know when we enter these things, we've all read in the blog post, startups are full of ups and downs, you know, but you can read about a roller coaster as many times as you want. And it's not until you ride a roller coaster that you know what it's really like. And so when you're really experiencing those downs, you're like, wait a second, I didn't sign up for this. It's like, yeah, you read it. And you're like, no, but I didn't know it was going to be like this. Like the downs are bad. Um, but zooming out and remembering that like they come with the big ups and whatever they are, whatever the ups and downs don't last forever. And the longer the roller coaster goes on, the less dramatic the ups and the downs feel. And so just trying to like zoom out on the journey and know that like this is very much not forever. Um whatever, whatever the thing you're going through is. So those are like the tactics, but it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great way to close. Last one I'd add is just also have a group of other founders that you could share this with, because there's very few people who understand it. And when you hear it from other people, you, you know, that you're, you're not alone. It feels, uh, you know, more tolerable if other people are, you know, um, doing it too. Um, the let, let, let's, let's close on that. Um, but, but uh, lastly, maybe, um, can we just plug Lattice really quick? Uh, you know, Lattice is not just a product, uh, you're not just a company, but also a way of uh, a way of company building, a way of management. And so, you just had this recent launch. Can you can you plug why founders listening or you know operators listening should have La incorporate Lattice at their companies? So historically, the thing that I think has been most important about Lattice is we help you basically make the most of the people that you have. That's the goal. In our highest aspiration, we're helping people be more productive. We're helping them have better relationships with their managers and their people around them. We're helping you have better practices for the way you do management. We're helping your managers have guardrails for the way that they operate. And I think like the reason we started in the first place was we basically saw that like without direct investment in management, company culture, general performance standards and practices, employee listening, like all of this stuff, it just like doesn't happen. And so we're trying to, as much as possible, like be that in a box for companies. Um, the thing that we've tried to do now in the last few months with the HRS launch is we're trying to expand from just being that sort of people management aspect to a broader HR solution so that companies as they're growing from 100 employees to 1,000 employees have like one system where they can do as much of their people work as possible. Um, and that's just like something that we've heard from customers constantly is the more we can combine tools, uh, the, the better an experience we're going to be able to deliver. So that's what we're about. 
Awesome. Yeah, I highly, highly recommend people people using it. Uh, Jack, um, you've given a, a service to the startup ecosystem by by doing this season with me. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap on that. Thanks so much for 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 doing it. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Eric.